You know, there's nothing like cracking that, that cellophane and pulling that record out. It just smells great. Welcome to Buzz Mayhem Hour. Non-stop hardcore energy. I love the show, guys. You're awesome. Yeah. Unlike any other. With your host, John the Bud, a.k.a. The Bodfather. Man, this stuff rocks. This is Dave McAnally from Derision Cult, and you're listening to Bod's Mayhem Hour. The views and opinions of the guest do not necessarily reflect the views and opinions of Bod's Mayhem Radio Network, its staff, affiliates, or sponsors. Parental discretion is advised. Welcome to Bod's Mayhem Radio Network. Hey, everybody. Welcome to Bod's Mayhem Hour podcast. And I want to thank everybody who's out there listening and watching and and the people who actually come back and listen to this podcast again. Thank you all so very much today. It's an honor and a huge privilege to have multi-instrumentalist solo artist Dave McAnally of Derision Cult. Dave is involved in a number of projects across a range of genres, folks. He's been featured on releases by Metropolis Records as well as his own imprint, South Street Dungeon. Dave McAnally is set to release their newest studio album, Charlatans Incorporated, on September 14th. Charlatans Incorporated album is the 15th Derision Cult album. 15 albums, man. That's mind-blowing because you know just as I do, it's one or two EPs and then done, just about. Yeah. Well, first of all, you're the the first guy I've talked to who's, said incorporated and not ink so uh we got the full name in there today so thanks a lot for that um (laughs) yeah you know i i kind of when i started this um i i was kind of putting stuff out as soon as i'd uh as soon as i'd record it and you know that just makes for a lot of projects and it's just me um but you know over over like the last couple years i've begun to kind of put more into releases and kind of, you know, the whole kind of, what do we really want to say here type mm-hmm. stuff. So that's, that's kind of slowed me down a bit in a good way, I think. Um, but yeah, early on I was, you know, the minute I had, you know, four songs and EP was going up pretty easy to do two of those a year when, you know, that's what you're focused on. I don't have a, no, I have a lot of other hobbies in this, so it makes it pretty easy, you know? Lots of times too, though, when you're pumping out music like that, you can oversaturate yourself and be like, "Wait, wait a second, I've got too much out there," and people's gonna be like, "Well, hold the hell up," you know? <laughs> yeah, 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 and that's um, that's definitely true. I, you know, when I, uh, I think a lot of people are like this when they first kind of start. You know, the natural tendency is you're doing this for you, you know, and you got something you want to say. And I think as time goes on, it gets. Uh, you start to be a little more cognizant of um, how people sure. might react to that, you know? Yeah, yeah. And exactly to your point, you know, once, uh, once you get rolling, you know, release schedules and kind of, you know, okay, now you have listeners. How do you make them wanting to hear more and not wishing they heard less? You right. Know? Right. And, uh, I'm, uh, I'm, I'm kind of bass backwards when it comes to that, it seems like. <laughs> so I'm, I'm late, but yeah, you know, those releases, a lot of the early ones, um, you know, just kind of EPs, um, you know, four songs a shot and I'm kind of being a little bit more selective and uh, spending more time with the tracks. You know, I'm late to the YouTube game. I mean, I I should have been doing this 11 years ago. You know, I've been doing this for 11 years. I've been doing YouTube now for four or five years. So I'm I'm late to this. So it's my fault. But Were you a terrestrial radio and stuff before that? Yeah, I was online radio. Yeah, you know, right on. Absolutely loved it, but man, when the royalties and everything, you had to start paying. I mean, I mean, I paid them, but yeah, it just kept getting more and more and more. Which I have no problem with it. It's just I know where my budget is and what right, I can do. Right. And I was like, well, podcasting. I love doing interviews. Every band to me is a national huge band. It doesn't matter if it's you know Joe next door to me. I treat every band the same as if, if I'm interviewing. Ozzy or Metallica or Danzig or anybody, you know, including yeah. yourself, I treat you just like, like I'm interviewing those guys. So, you know. Yeah. Well, you know, I think it's, um, what's cool about conversations like this is, um, you know, and I'm sure just kind of before we started, you and I were talking about Metallica and how important that band is. And, you know, I'm the same way. And I think, uh, you know, just this format and how we're, you know, 
how we're just riffing right now is such a it's such a more real way to engage people you know yeah and, yeah you know like you said whether or not it's uh you know somebody like glenn danzig or whoever you know they're all just people right and mm -hmm. uh, i think that's what you know we all ultimately relate to so how excited are you to release this upcoming 15th album entitled charlatans incorporated man for you personally i mean i know you got so much stuff in there but what sets this aside from the rest of them possibly mm -hmm. if anything yeah well um there's a couple differences one um the uh a lot of those early things i only did digital and this time uh you know partially and, I, and i'll talk about this in a minute but um there's really some things I really wanted to say on this that, uh, you know, more kind of looking out. And so I did a couple things different. First, um, I worked with an actual visual artist to design a concept. So the cover of the album is a piece called Riot Party from a street artist out of, uh, out of Iowa. And it's a riot, police riot helmet with kind of the booze helmet uh, kind of mashed up. And the reason for that is kind of has to do with what the theme of the album is. And this is something that um, I'm excited about from the standpoint that, you know, I feel like this is something that kind of relates to kind of my outside music world. Um, but the album is really, if I were to kind of try to summarize it, and if you and I are an elevator and I had five seconds to explain it, this album is about the commercialization of just public outrage. And what I mean by that is a um, little bit about me. So I've spent a lot of years in the advertising business. I was an ad exec, worked with a lot of big brands um, all over the world. And what Charlotte and Zinc is about is, you know, in the last five, you know, five to specifically five years, um, what I've started to notice is kind of a technique that a lot of brands that, you know, you would know, uh, uh, any of us would know, um, are using where, you know, right now, you know, the, the, especially in America, things are kind of so heated, things are really divided. Um, you know, there's a lot of, you know, it's, you know, and, and there's a lot of reasons for that, you know, who's, you know, and, and whatever your political opinions are. But the point is, when you're mad, and you're pissed off, and um, you just anybody, whether it's me or you, we kind of become a little irrational. Well, brands and businesses and commerce picks up on that. And we used to have a saying in the ad industry called uh, enragement equals engagement. If I can get you really pissed off about something, you're going to be paying attention to your phone more. You're watching stories about that thing. And that um, on the heels of that, uh, I think what happened is uh, brands realized, man, if we can sort of poke stoke fires on those things uh, and get people enraged, we can sell more products. But it's pretty sophisticated how this is done. Um, I'll give you an example. Um, I was approached about a year and a half ago to help a gun manufacturer um, market a new gun. It was an AR-15 designed for children. And oh, wow. I think when I, when I tell you that, you're like, what in the hell? Well, the reality is it was a, it's a safety training gun. They had a patent on a certain kind of trigger that would like if grandpa's out teaching, you know, grandkid how to shoot, this eliminates the odds of a, um, of a back, you know, backfire or whatever. Sure. Um, now that's not what they wanted to sell. What they wanted my help with was to leak that story to places like the daily show, um, run ads, targeting gun control advocates, just putting it out there, there's an AR-15 for kids because they knew if we can get them outraged and, you know, look at these idiots making, you know, just all that noise that would happen and the controversy, they will sell way more of those guns. Mm -hmm. And we had the data to prove it. And, um, you know, everything. I didn't, I ended up not taking that project, but that's the kind of reality that we live in. Um, when there are, you know, when we have things like social media to amplify how mad we are. Um, and it happens regardless of what your political opinions are. Um, I know I was pretty close to the Nike campaign when they signed Colin Kaepernick. And uh, we knew we had the data that, hey, 
this is, and in fact, you can see it in the Nike 10 K. If you, you can Google it and see what they told shareholders, they're going to run some campaigns that are meant to push buttons. And they knew when they signed that guy, they, it was all part of the plan. There would be shoe burnings that this would, you know, you know, a lot of, you know, people of a certain group. We also knew that the cohort that's buying the most shoes that has the disposable income tend to be urban and they tend to be, you know, left, you know, liberal leaning. And if those people saw these people getting mad, now Nike says something about who they are as people. And that was, you know, when I think about kind of what I really want to say on this album, that particular moment was pretty watershed for me because that was like, we are fucking stoking all this outrage and pissing these people off and, you know, all just to sell more shoes and more product. And it seemed, it felt to me like pretty crass when you look at it, but you know, that worked, man. Nike's market cap was up 26 billion after that campaign. And, um, you know, I, I you know, it, it's been a little while, but I think that concept of like, let me find somebody who's going to get really mad at me. And these people over here are going to, you know, and I just thought, you know, and I think about like the world that, you know, that's going to be the kind of world my kids have to live in and how they have to make decisions. And so it's really important, I think, for people. And I talk about this a lot on the album is that when you know, you're presented with a piece of news or, or it's important that you ask, what is this trying to do? Is this trying to piss me off? Is this trying to, you know, provoke a certain reaction out of me? Um, because, you know, it's, we kind of live in a world where it's not necessarily that people want you to think they want you to feel, you know, and they want to get a reaction out of you. So back to your question, am I excited about this album? I think this is the first time I really had a coherent message like that, that, um, you know, I want to say, and I want it to be kind of what the statement is. Um, and it sort of relates to something that, you know, I have some experience with that. And I think it's pretty important. Um, I don't think that's going to change. You know, I don't think just because Trump's out of office or just because uh, I think, you know, and in fact, there's the, the track, the great reset, you know, when we look at who actually funds who's in office and things like that. It's kind of the same. We're sort of rearranging deck chairs, you know, these concepts and, you know, fueling outrage, uh, doesn't necessarily change with whoever's in office you know what i mean oh yeah for sure and yeah i i'm right there with you man it, it frustrates me on stuff that i see and and you're right man they they they, they advertise this shit to to push your buttons they know what they're doing right. so right. you know was this very important to you to put this type of album out and do you think the pandemic actually fed more fuel to your fire with this um kind of in two ways uh yeah um you know the, the album is it's heavier and you know there's a lot more kind of just sounds like a good somebody beating the hell out of a guitar um <laughs> because uh you know it was a pretty stressful time uh the company i my company got kind of decimated by covid and that's you know anyone who's gone through trying to figure out how to you know make ends meet and stuff like that knows what that kind of stress is like and you know if you have a family and stuff and you know, I have a heavy bag in the basement. I had a guitar, so I just come down here and that's my speed bag. So that really was, you know, musically that, that was a big thing. Um, do I think the pandemic a hundred percent, you know, I mean, just think of the, you know, anytime you have anxieties and emotions like that, um, you know, you are going, you're going to create a sense of irrationality and you are, I mean, just to put it, bluntly you're easier to market to when you're in that state of mind you're not thinking you know um whenever i'm doing things with like you know business to business type work that's a much more rational sale um you think you know and and this isn't anything new you know i mean you think about when we were kids you know, you're gonna get the girl if you drink this kind of beer or you're gonna oh, yeah. be more sophisticated if you use this kind of dishwashing soap or whatever it's all bullshit but you know those those sorts of emotional attachments are, are why we buy products when that migrated to it's not necessarily about getting girls anymore now it's about what is this product going to say about you and your beliefs and your political beliefs and man that's a um you know like i said you know you're talking 26 billion added to a market cap on the heels of a campaign like that people pay attention 
And so I think we're going to see that shift happen. And I think the pandemic definitely accelerated it. Um, you know, it's, uh, you know, anytime you have a, a, a con, you know, a group of people kind of anxious and things like that, those things are going to happen. So yeah, yeah, for sure. Um, but my hope is that, um, as, uh, you know, I think about my kids, like I have a seven year old daughter that, um, I, I think her, her bullshit filter is kind of inherently a little better than maybe mine was at her age. <laughs> and so, uh, you know, maybe part of kind of just human evolution is we're going to get, we're, we're remember how, like, um, if you go back and watch like nightmare on Elm street now, it's not all that's her jaws. Yep. Um, and that's just because I think we're just, um, I, I hope we kind of grow immune to this stuff, but we're kind of in a period right now where that's where we're going through some growing pains. I think it's like, I remember when I was a kid and I remember all the Nintendo commercials and I'm like, I gotta get me a Nintendo. I gotta be one of the cool kids. Sorry, son. Yeah, man, I did. had, uh, yeah, the eight bit. I, I had those, I had to get a paper out to get mine. Mm -hmm. uh, that's the only gaming system I've ever had, man. I, <laughs> I, I was like, Mike Tyson's punch out. Can't get any better than this. <laughs> hey, no, I'm serious. That's, that's the only gaming system I've ever had in my life. Now, um, my daughter, my, my stepson, he got an Xbox and all that, but, uh, yeah, I never, that, that was just, I, I figured it was that eight bit was perfection. Nintendo, Super Mario Brothers 3, and Tecmo Super Bowl was my drug right there. Those were my two games. Mario, yeah, I did Super Mario 3. Um, well, Tecmo, wasn't that the one where Bo Jackson could run like 10 times as fast as all the other guys? And yeah, I love when somebody got injured. They'd, act, they'd actually bring it out of the ambulance. They'd show the screenshot of the ambulance and packing them off. It was cool. Nowadays, the game's just like, man. <laughs> man, you're going to man. Now I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to have to go play Tecmo. I've got it. <laughs> I got upstairs. So. <laughs> now you played in bands in the nineties in Iowa. Then you moved to Chicago and didn't play for a while. What got you back into playing music again? What was it for you that said, man, I, I got to get back into this. Yeah. Um, well, you know, it was one of those things where when I moved to Chicago, it was, uh, it, it was kind of work related and it was, I think probably a classic story. Everyone has, you know, broke up with a girlfriend and, you know, had some opportunities in the big city and it was like, Oh, this is a sign. And <laughs> so I did, I, I left for Chicago kind of when I got here, I was thinking, well, I'll find some guys to play with. And um, now life just happened, you know, career took off and all that um, got interested in some other stuff and then, you know, but I always missed it. And I think one of the things that was really inspiring for me is, um, you know, there's a lot of, there's a lot of talent in Chicago um, across a lot of different genres. And um, one of the people that was in the industry I'm in is uh, Jim Marcus from Die Warza, Go Fight, Industrial Band, Seminole, Chicago stuff. And I ran into him uh at an agent at our agency headquarters in uh on michigan and michigan avenue in chicago and that's when i learned you know while he was doing all that stuff he was also a highly influential creative director on uh um he makes fonts you know like like the different fonts for brands and so he's like killing it in that world and writing all this like really what i think is really vital music and that really got me inspired to think you know you can do more than you, you can be active in a lot of things. And I know it probably sounds silly to say in retrospect, but um, that was really inspiring. And so I decided, you know, I'm going to build a rig and I'm going to start doing music again for if for any other reason than just, I just the joy of making music. Right. I didn't really set about any plans of, you know, well, I'm going to start a band and we're going to go on tour. I, none of that. I just, I, I like creating stuff and take over the world. <laughs> yeah, you know, um, and I'll tell you what, man, I grew up, um, you know, the, the Slipknot guys were kind of in the scene I was in the 90s and, you know, around Des Moines. And, you know, I'll say this, man, anybody who says those aren't hardworking guys are crazy because, yeah. uh, you know, the amount of just the dedicated, you know, they were just too busy to care about anything else. And, um, you know, obviously it's paid off, you know, or that that band's 
they've gone on to be what they are. But um, so I had a really good sense of like, all right, taking over the world, what does that actually look like, you know, from a work standpoint, because I was sort of there when uh, that was all taking off. But um, yeah, you know, for me, it was just the joy of music. And, and, you know, I really, that really resonated with me talking with Jim that like, you know, art for the sake of leaving kind of your footprint on the cultural zeitgeist, um, as wordy as that sounds, has a lot of value in and of itself. And, um, you know, you have so much time on the planet and what you do with your time and, you know, things like, you know, are you going to create things that'll be around, you know, um, whether or not they're, you know, huge in, in, when you're here, I mean, that's great if they are got good for you, but, um, just that joy in and of itself is what was um, really inspired me, man. Did you have any uh, any run-ins with the guys from Slipknot while you were in Des Moines at all? Yeah, yeah. Um, Sean, the, the clown, he owned a club called the Safari Club in Des Moines that they actually designed the stage to fit Slipknot on it when uh, they were starting out. And, um, oh, God, let's see. They were, I think they were called the Pale Ones before... Uh, before it became Slipknot, but uh, yeah, no, I, I knew them. Uh, Jim, I believe, is in a band called Dead Front, played with a few times, um, and so uh, yeah, no, just numerous, but you know, back then, I don't think anybody, I mean, no one knew, right? Like, no sure. one had 1997 that, like, you know, I mean, you used to be able to go to the record store, and there'd be copies of Mate that their their that mate feed kill repeat demo i mean now they're worth tons of money those originals but you just you just never know and kind of to your point earlier about talking with you know musicians of all you just never know you know exactly right um you know the next next big thing and uh but i think yeah with them um it seemed like you know, just, just from the word go, you always got to buy that those guys were really, really driven. But there was a few bands like that in Des Moines, you know, um, that were like big scenesters. Um, this guy named Gabe Wilkinson that um, has done a lot of remixes for me and I've done for him and I've played on his albums. He's got a project called Microwave. And he was in a band called Smack Dab that was a really big Des Moines band, kind of right up there with Slipknot in terms of who was drawn to the clubs and everything. And um, yeah, you know, I mean, there's there's a bunch of those. But yeah, um, you know, I, I suppose if if Corey Taylor were here right now, I could probably name a few places that we used to hang and he might remember them. But, you know, we're talking 20 plus years ago here. So oh, yeah. I, I wish he'd, I I wish he'd be in my that. podcast. <laughs> I, I would love to get him on my podcast. That's for sure. Corey, please come on my podcast. Yeah, all right. I'll make you some Hot Pockets and popcorn or something. <laughs> <laughs> so what's your thoughts on us losing joey georgeson as young as he was yeah I, knew, I remember him um well you know um he, he's only a few years older than i am um no real i mean it's a it's a real shame you know i don't know all the details of what you know what 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 transpired in the last few years and so you know don't really I don't really want to speculate on any of that, but you know, anytime for me, at least, you know, whether it's him or, you know, anybody in, in the scene or in, in our, in, in the metal world, you know, it really, it, it, it really gives you kind of a sense of, you know, life is life's precious, you know, and, um, you know, I, I think we need to, um, you know, those things are just reminders that, you know, kind of the, the fragility of life and, and, you know, so forth. And, you know, there's two people in that band that have passed away now, and I can't imagine what that must be like, you know, yeah. um, for them. But, yeah, it's, uh, you know, obviously he's a fan, you know, amazing drummer and his legacy and the work he did is going to live forever. And, you know, there'll be kids 100 years from now that are going to, pick up the drums because of things he did so you know um i suppose that doesn't give his loved ones any more comfort but uh you know um you you, you definitely can't take anything away from what he accomplished while he was here mm -hmm. you know 
So you went to be a solo artist with this and you did a lot of self-producing on these uh, albums and EPs, man. What, what made you want to just go the solo artist route and maybe one day are you opposed to actually forming a band or just want to do it this way? Um, honestly, practicality. I was like, I got a drum machine. I got guitars. I got bass. Let's go. Um, (laughs) you know, and I'll be honest. I, I, I had, you know, and anyone who's been in bands can relate to this. There's, um, I just kind of when I started, I just felt, you know, I, I had a lot of experience having to babysit things like drug problems and stuff like that amongst bandmates. And uh, I just ain't got no time for that anymore. <laughs> and um, sure, sure. so some of that, but, you know, I think, um, I think more and more about like, you know, turning some of this into a band, um, I definitely enjoy playing and collaborating with people. I've been doing that a lot more uh, on other people's albums and, um, you know, so forth. And uh, that's really cool. I think, you know, I think one thing that um, the pandemic kind of did that uh, was really interesting to me is that uh, I'm seeing uh, a lot more just kind of people figuring out things like splice and how to collaborate on the internet and all of that, you know, kind of cause you had to. Um, and, uh, I think my, my hope is like, maybe that lives on in this mm-hmm. thing about people working together on albums across States or across countries and things like that'll, I don't want to say become the norm, but like, won't be that unusual. Like, Hey, if I want to do something with a guy in Germany, we all know oh, how yeah. to that happen and it's not going to be some logistical nightmare like it would have been like 20 years ago right yeah and, uh, and it gives you more freedom to do what you want yeah yeah absolutely so yeah you know um as time goes on and you know especially as you know my project's getting more attention i think more and more about uh you know people that i can play with <laughs> and um you know ways we could do things live so i don't have any like immediate plans but um definitely seems like something that'd be cool to do uh, so you know i think uh you know probably I'll, I'll keep on doing collaborations remixes and stuff like that but uh you know as live music opens up and um you know and, and i think people really get excited to see shows again uh yeah you know i i, I definitely think the bug could bite i uh <laughs> I, I'll put it this way. I wouldn't want to do anything that's like half-assed, you know? Like oh, I yeah. Really yeah, for sure. Really build, you know, if we're going to do it, let's really do something that we'll be proud of and, you know, all that. I wouldn't, you know, not really interested in just a bunch of guys with a case of beer and let's just jam until we're too drunk to play. Like, I'm, <laughs> I'm over that phase of my life, you know? And I said this earlier, and I don't mean this in a derogatory way or, or even a bad way. I hate that covid hit everybody i know we lost a lot of great people but in a way for musicians it was kind of a, a blessing a blessing in dark skies if that makes sense because bands are now on an even playing field even my next door neighbors you know what i'm saying oh, yeah. and the reason and the reason why i say this is because everybody has an opportunity than previously i believe because there's not much i don't think it's oversaturated like it used to be you know what I'm saying? When I mean, you have like your next door neighbor that plays or whatever, they have an opportunity now to be heard finally. Yeah. That, that's that's my opinion, I guess. That's what I take yeah. from it. Well, I'll tell you what, man. Um, you know, one thing that just for me personally in the last, uh, oh, probably six months, and this is me like being an old curmudgeon, but I find, you know, my wife, who discovers the music in the house, you know, like she'll tell me, Hey, have you heard of this pair? Cause she's really got her ear to the ground, especially with metal. Uh, I've, I've married a very metal woman and, um, <laughs> the, uh, which is great, but, um, I find myself listening to a lot like stuff like what you're doing. And, um, you know, a lot of the just, um, just online, you know, radio and especially like even some of the stations that are doing, I see, I, feels to me like stations are doing a lot more like local or independent shows, you know, like yep. they'll pick an hour or so. And dude, there is some really great stuff out there, you know, are. Um, I have been, you know, it, it, like I really, truly enjoy that. I think, and I think things like Bandcamp that have, um, you know, made it possible to, you know, maybe to my detriment, like it's super easy to release things now, 
Um, I think you're exactly right on that front that, you know, the level playing field in the sense that if I was going to do, you know, put out like, you know, Charlotte and Zinc like 20 years ago, you know, to release it the way I'm releasing, even to talk to you, well, we probably would have had to figure out where we're because you're in Kentucky and I'm in Chicago. Yeah. We'd have to figure that out. We'd have to, you know, I'd have to figure out how to get distribution for that album. I probably wouldn't be able to promote it the way I'm promoting it, you know, because you know the, the channels weren't available. But all of that's really doable for anybody now, uh, if you're willing to put in the time and you know, just uh you know, learn, you know, l- learn the lay of the land. So I think that's really cool. Um but yeah, I, it's, it's really interesting to me how uh, much I'm finding myself just like really enjoying some of these, this, you know, the indie music and stuff that, um, you know, it, I'm sure, you know, I don't want to say deserves to be heard, but um, whether it's heard or not, I'm listening to it. And, you know, I, you know, that's really interesting. I'm, you know, in some ways it's, you know, I'm sure you probably remember this. I mean, I get a little nostalgic and have a place in my heart for the days of going to the record store and there'd be that tastemaker guy there that, you know, you know, Oh, have you heard this or buying something? Cause you saw the album cover and yeah. you know, maybe some of that will start to come. I, I, I think it is kind of coming back in a more digital 21st century way, but uh, you know, anyone who was there will tell you, Oh, there's nothing like having that local music store scene and all that, but for sure. Yeah. Definitely, I, I enjoy the level playing field thing just from the standpoint of bands that I just never would have heard I'm hearing now, and I'm really thankful for that. Um, Are you sure. walking to the store like that, man? They've got a, 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 a special feature band that they're playing, and you're yeah. like, this is cool, man. Yeah, their album's right over here. Go buy it. And it's like, I'm a sucker for it. I'm like, okay. Yeah. <laughs> I remember back in the day, I used to, um, there was a band I was in in the 90s, and we did a couple of those in store things. And, uh, you know, to some extent, it's kind of like they're kind of our spinal tap moments, right? Because you'd be up there playing your music and in comes mom from the gap with like her four and a half kids. And, <laughs> you know, you're trying to be serious and very, you know, macho. And it's kind of hard to pull off when it's like, well, here's the, you know, the gaps over here, the candle stores over here in the middle of <laughs> Sam Goody. And, you know, you're kind of pissing off the candle people because, you know, they've got their Kenny G going. And you know. <laughs> so let's be honest, it wasn't all that. Mis- I'm talking myself right out of this nostalgia as we're sitting here. So were you a little nervous releasing new music right now at all? Or, or no, we just want to get out there to stay relevant? Not so much for me. Um, you know, I think uh, kind of like what I was telling you with, kind of what the album's about i i felt like you know it's 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 a timely thing to comment on and you know i don't want to say now or never but you know at some point you kind of miss your sell by date point um i think you know no i i wasn't really nervous about that but i'll tell you what man i might i've seen some releases that happened while you know over the lockdown that well look at that acdc album i mean that's a band that's going to sell records regardless, but, um, you know, that's like a huge live music event for those guys. And so I'm sure, you know, I I feel bad for people who they're going to buy that album and, you know, go see it, you know, my, um, you know, and and ACDC is one of those bands that like, I would go because I want to take my kids, you know, mm-hmm. I saw when I was younger and my daughter thinks that Thunderstruck video is like the coolest thing ever. And <laughs> where you can see the stick with the hi-hat, and, mm-hmm. you know, I'd, I'd love to, you know, take her, but you know, for those big events where, you know, live music, such a big part of the experience. Um, my, I, I really, you know, th- that's really too bad for those, for those people, not just, you know, from a monetary standpoint, but you know, part of live, you know, the live performance is part of the art, you know, and um, when you miss that, it's, yeah, it's something different. But yeah, for me, I think the thing that, you know, if I, if I'm nervous about anything, it's just, um, this is the first time I've really kind of put an opinion out there that I don't think anyone would really disagree with, but I could, you know, I'm, I'm talking a lot about, you know, kind of my own truth with, 
you know, I could ruffle feathers with, you know, ex coworkers and things, but at some point I just made a decision that, you know, it's something that I want to say that I feel is important. And I think industrial metal is the best vehicle to say it. So mm-hmm. any tracks standing out more to you than any right now on this? Album? I know it must change every time you listen to it. And I know these are your babies, but do you have any that possibly stick out for you? Um, well, I really like, uh, there's a track on there called Amplify that I'm really happy with right now because it's, uh, it's probably the most like kind of to the point one I've ever done. You know, it's less than three minutes long. Um, it was one that I almost didn't put on the album because I was really struggling with, uh, with a couple parts and it was one of the last ones to really click for me. So I'm really happy with that. There's one on there called this is control. That is kind of the redheaded uh, stepchild of all of them in the sense that it's really different. Mm-hmm. You know, like I was telling you when I initially did this, um, there's a lot of just bashing guitars and a lot, you know, it's, it's a very heavy, you know, it, it's very heavy in that sense. And that's one that I want to kind of have be in the middle. It's almost like a palate cleanse. And so, um, that one, I'm really happy that I put it on there because it does stand out differently. Um, so yeah, I would say right now I'm, I, I was listening to Amplify earlier today and, uh, yeah, I like this as control just because it is, it, it it shows that there's more to this thing than just, you know, a riff hammered into your head for five minutes, you know. Has there ever been like anything you've released and, and you've been listening to it and then something just clicks and you're like, oh God, I'm going to have to go back and remaster that one <laughs> soon down the road. Time, man. <laughs> um, you know, and, and it, it is, I, I bet everybody has that, you know. Sure. Um, and uh, at, at some point I kind of look at it like, you know, it's, it's a moment in time. It was, you know, it was the best you could do at that point. Um, but you know, I, I, I kind of use those things as like fuel for the next go round, you know, uh, like, okay, well that didn't, maybe that wasn't, oh, I wish I could have fixed that. Well, now I know that for next time, you mm-hmm. know? So that, that tends to be how I internalize that stuff. Um, you know, already, you know, one of the things I'm thinking about with this one is kind of a producer to work with next time um, to kind of take the sound of somewhere that's kind of out of my area of expertise. But uh, I've got a guy in mind here that uh, I haven't really talked. I've, we've had a couple emails, but um, that'll be really cool. And I think that'll be, uh, that'll be kind of a next step. So the things that I would hear that I'm like right now, like, if if not cringe moments there's definitely ones where you know early on where it feels like the picture of yourself in first grade when your ears are too big and your hair was funny you know like i have a few like that but um uh you know nowadays it's more kind of like oh well if i really wanted to take this particular element to the next level you know i think about like well how would i do that and kind of the conclusion i'm coming to is i'll have to kind of work with the producer to do that yeah and it's good to have a, a different set of ears you know to, to push you more than say you're just doing it yourself because yeah. yeah i have a guy that i work with that uh, does that um he'll come over and he's he's a sound guy sound engineer out of um i was named sam buck and uh he'll kind of come through and and fix you know if there's like phasing issues and stuff like that and um you know, he's pretty, he's pretty blunt. Like I would not, um, you know, we've known each other forever. So if something really sucks, he doesn't try to be nice to me. He will just say that sucks, (laughs) Um, which, you know, I'd rather him say it than like everybody else. But, um, you know, he, he, I, I, that, that's probably, I I do find a lot of value in that, you know, um, and especially, you know, with this album and, you know, people reviewing it and things. Um, yeah. You know, you, you hear that kind of feedback, but uh, yeah, no, for sure. Were there any tracks that didn't make this album, David, that we could see down the line possibly on an EP or another full length? Um, yeah. Uh, I usually, whenever I, I, whenever I'm making stuff, I usually, I, I create a lot more than what I actually need. How many actually turn into songs is a different story, but like with this album, you know, it started with just a lot of bashing riffs, and themes, and things like that. And um, 
you know, eventually those all strung together. So there's a lot of stuff that didn't make the album. I guess it's, uh, I kind of describe it as kind of like making head cheese, you know, you put everything in and scrape off what comes off the top. So, um, yeah, maybe. Um, I think a lot of times there'll be, you know, for me, there's, there's riffs or ideas and stuff that, you know, what, for whatever reason, they don't really reveal themselves as songs at a time, but then later down the road, they do. Um, there's a track on um, uh, uh, Electronic Saviors, uh, the Distortion Productions Metropolis comp um, that I did called Sins of the Father. And that riff I had, or, you know, that was kind of a song idea I had for years before it actually turned into uh, something I could release. Um, and that was just because things just weren't clicking and all that. And then finally it did and it turned out, you know, turned out really great for me, you know, cause it's got a lot of attention from it, but yeah, I, I, I would say in some way, shape or form that'll happen. Was there a track that you were working on this album that totally ended up sounding different than it was intended to possibly or Tina two, four. Yeah, man. Worlds collide. Uh, originally had like a whole big bridge and slow part in it and uh, almost like a surf rock riff um and it just kind of drug on so i ended up not using that um or i ended up kind of re redoing it um that was probably the biggest example of that uh there's a track called call a man god on there that uh, originally was two songs that I sort of frankenstein together and <laughs> which is funny because uh you know, that was one that um, kind of really, I felt like it kind of went in a lot of different directions, but that's a reviewer recently, uh, just recently said, that's probably in terms of uh, being the most engaging track. That's the one that stood out to him. So I guess I did something right, you know, <laughs> uh, but yeah, I, you know, the worlds collide thing. And I, I'd like to do that more. I, one of my, especially with, um, you know, cause I'm, I'm a metal guy, industrial and all that. Like I like creating this kind of music, but I listen to a lot of different things, you know? Um, I don't, well, they're from Southern Indiana, but um, I don't know if you're familiar with the Reverend Peyton. Uh, it's a Southern Indiana band about, I guess it'd be a few hours from where you are, but total bluegrass, old school, you know, forties blues stuff. And I love that guy. Never going to play guitar like him. Just, <laughs> it's just not going to happen. But uh, you know, um i like to i like finding ways to infuse things like surf rock and reggae and blues and things like that into what i do but um not so much in a you know obvious way but more you know there's techniques and motifs that are popular and that kind of stuff that i think can translate really well to metal. so i'm always trying to do that um so i think that'll that always leads to me to having songs that come together in weird ways I thought this was cool, and I was going to mention to you earlier, but we'll talk about it now. As, as I like the actual album cover right part, I, I love this of uh, the beer, uh, the oh, beer pans on the side. Shirt, yes, man. that I, I love that. So, how how was working with Brett Miller, who created this? Did did he get exactly what you wanted, or he just run with it, or what actually yeah. happened? Yeah. So, um, on Instagram, he's Brett Miller's art, and. Uh, yeah, he really did. Um, so what happened is, you know, his, you know, he's very inspired by guys like Banksy and all that. I have, I have the original piece upstairs, but um, we, I showed him the tracks and I told him a lot about what I wanted to say, mm -hmm. how, you know, civil unrest and, you know, just people being agitated and all, especially in the last year, there are profiteers on that, you know, um, people figured out how to make money on, you know, just civil unrest and i think that's something that can be a real evil or it can be very very dangerous if you're not aware that it's happening and we talked a lot about that and i asked him you know what what could be a way that we could visually represent that and um he came back he kind of mentioned at the time he's like i think i got something but give me a couple weeks and he came back with that idea of like we need to we'll take a police riot helmet and we'll put the 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 you know the beer for the party up there with the idea of uh showing kind of sort of clashing these two things these two ideas and then you know the dollar sign kind of represents you know kind of consumerism aspect 
then the other side, um, you know, enjoy woke. Uh, we wanted to take an old classic slogan and kind of subvert it with something a little more political. And that one, uh, that, that made a lot of sense, you know, so you can kind of see the coat font, you know, with woke under it. And so it's not necessarily meant to like, agree one way or the other but the point being it represents kind of how these brands are injecting themselves into this and um i, I think fueling kind of a lot of that unrest so yeah i'm really happy with that i think it turned out cool we're um that was the first time i really worked with brett um but we'll definitely do stuff in the future i think we're already kind of noodling around on different ideas and all that <laughs> but i like his style for sure we've got uh we're going to do a whole campaign around it. <laughs> what do you hope everyone takes away while listening to this album or this single or any of Derision's cult music in general? What do you hope they get from it, man? Well, um, you know, I'm not so, uh, I'm not so self-involved to think that like, Oh, this is going to change the way people think, but I hope they enjoy the tracks, man. Um, if there's, there's some good songs to lift weights to on there um things like that uh i hope if anything it it um you know if, if they do take away that message uh i just it's really important to me that people understand that you know um things aren't always as altruistic as they seem you know uh there's motivations behind a lot of uh you know how things are covered um, it's cheaper to have people talk about the news than it is to actually report on it. Mm -hmm. and that changes, um, that changes how, you know, that media can be manipulated and, you know, angles. And I just, I think that's so important right now because, uh, you know, I, I, and I'm sure you've seen it too, man. Um, people are kind of coming off the sidelines that maybe weren't, uh, weren't, didn't care so much about political things that are suddenly really fired up about stuff yep. and you know i'm not saying that's good or bad that they are but what that does mean is that people are going to want to get in there you know the you know, not necessarily brand well yeah brands i mean there are forces that want to get in your head and provoke reactions out of you and you're like that because of you know all these other things we talked about and so i just uh I just, like I said, you know, I think that's really important. Um, and it's something that because of my background, um, I really wanted to talk about. So I hope, you know, that's why we did the cover the way we did. That's why we called the album, you know, Charlotte and Zinc. Um, you know, the tracks kind of, a lot of the samples and the tracks kind of reflect that too. So, um, you know, that's, that's all kind of part of it. Yeah. And there may be somebody out there who actually needs this album to help them. I mean, people can latch on to anything and take their own view of it. So, I mean, you may have something, man, that somebody latches onto that could really help them, give them inspiration or just, you know, give them an extra step in their walk. I mean, yeah. So well, I appreciate it, man. That's cool to say. I, um, yeah, I sure hope so. You know, I mean, music's like that for me, for sure. You for know? sure. Um, yeah. And to your point, you know, there are things I, I happen to know from talking to the artist that I thought the song the song spoke to me in one way that was kind of not what they intended at all, but that's not a bad thing. That's kind of cool when um, music kind of starts to communicate on a different level. You know, we were, uh, you know, we were talking about Metallica earlier and, you know, you think, I think of a song like fade to black, which, you know, the lyrics, I think kind of on the face of them are obviously, you know, talking about suicide and all that, but, uh, you know, that can speak to somebody who's just feeling down. They're not, they're not at that level, mm -hmm. but it's relatable. And, um, yeah, I, uh, yeah, I, I feel that way about a lot of tracks. Master of puppets saved my life. So, yeah. yeah. And, and, and it's so weird that Orion and everybody's like, I love that Orion song. It's, a, it's an instrumental man. <laughs> right. Right. <laughs> that that song was the one that saved my life that night. So oh, yeah. any, anything that you can gravitate to man, that helps you. So be hit. So be hit. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. You know, it's funny is, um, we, uh, this is going to sound like a weird story, but, um, <laughs> in 2016, we went and hung out with Metallica before the, uh, 
before they did that show in Minneapolis is guests of Winona Judd, um, who my buddy trains her dogs and she invited us up there. And uh, I'm not saying this to name drop or anything. I just, uh, when I, uh, you know, we didn't have a ton of time with them, but you know, I'm, you think about things that you would say to somebody like James Hetfield, you know, or, or any of those guys, Lars, or, you know, and you want to tell them that stuff. I end up talking with James about what the best truck stops are between Chicago and Minneapolis. So <laughs> it was, uh, that's about as good and profound as it got for me. But uh, yeah, no, I know what hey, you mean. You got to talk to him, brother. That's more than what I have. So, you know, yeah, it's something else when you're, you know, and it's funny because since then, you know, I, I, you know, I, somebody asked me this the other day about getting starstruck and all that. And I, I really, that was probably like the only time it was like really like for me like holy crap that's um, yeah that um but ever since then i've, I've kind of gotten a lot better at um you know really when i'm around people like they're, they're human you know um we were on i was out out west a little bit ago with around around a bunch of thrash guys and you know it's uh Definitely, that was kind of like the high point for me, but not in a, well, I'm never going to be you know, more famous. Just, you know, that conversation with James, I think in particular, was really, uh, you know, dude, we're talking about truck stop food, you know, like, well, still, God, <laughs> you know? at least you didn't have a Chris Farley moment like you did on SNL with, with Paul McCartney, you know, <laughs> remember that time? Remember that time you wrote a Ryan, remember that? <laughs> I can see James, uh, yeah, yeah, Cliff. Cliff Cliff did all that. Uh <laughs> I'm gonna go now. Yeah. <laughs> I love oh my god. Love Chris Farley. Nothing but best for Chris Farley, man. Yeah, yeah. Sucks we lost him too. See oh, I get so frustrated when I think about stuff like that. Like why? Why did you know why? Just stop, man. <laughs> There's another project called Sis Machine that uh, Kim from Bow Ever down and yourself yeah. did earlier this year will this ever see the light of day possibly soon maybe yeah man we're working on that now it's uh good deal working on some remixes and uh yeah she's super talented man um i think what's cool about her too is just how you know she's self-releasing everything and she just she really works hard and people like that inspire me you know where they just you know they're really getting after it and she's very supportive of like kind of that scene that she's in and um you know, the world needs people like that. So, uh, I, th- I think that's cool, but yeah, we're, uh, her, uh, Gabe from microwave. We got a few others that were lining up, um, doing remixes and things like that. That'll be, that's like more, um, it's definitely not a metal thing. That's more, uh, that'll be a really dark electronic slow. Um, that'll be slow mood music for sure. But, uh, yeah, I'm looking forward to that. Do you still have a go-to album or song that you find yourself going back to and listening to still to this day, possibly, man? Um, you mean a mine or just like just, just in general? Like when you was a kid or anything, oh, yeah. possibly? I mean. Oh, I'm like you. you know, I grew up kind of, you know, metallic and metal and stuff like that. You know, I think the one, um, I, probably the one album that's like st- – gets better and better with age it's like a fine line or something is uh black sabbath volume four um mm. that, that album just always sticks with me um in terms of just a song uh um you know really the the one that really got me going down the path of more industrial and electronic stuff was uh and it's not even in that genre but um when I saw David Bowie with Nine Inch Nails in 95, um, man, that version they did of Scary Monsters, the Bowie tune, like, you know, and uh, so that one I'll listen to for, I'll, I put that on all the time. That whole album, Scary Monsters, but that song in particular, that's my, that is my, uh, that's my go-to one for sure. Dave, how can folks stay in touch with you, man? Buy some merchandise, buy this new album, all this yeah. good stuff for you, brother. How can he do that? Uh, I can go to derisioncult.com. Um, that's where that'll lead you to the band camp page. We're going to do a lot of merch on there. The album comes out September 14th. And then um, 
Also, if you go to southstreetdungeon.com, that has all the projects that I'm doing. And I have kind of a blog of, you know, what stuff I'm up to, but you can connect to YouTube and everything uh, for me from there. So that's kind of like the nerve center of what I do. And I call it South Street Dungeon because I live on a street called South Street. And as you can see, it's sort of dungeony down here. So Dave's going to Dave, Dave's gonna send me money. They, they was going to send me a uh, deep dish Chicago pizza soon. Ah, dude. Uh, yeah. <laughs> Pequods is the jam here. And that's like the one that like, so with people who are like from outside, my wife would kill me if she heard me say this, but like Luminati's is like the tourist pizza. Um, if you're a local and you're in the know, there's a place called Pequods, no reservations. Um, you got to just show up and get lucky that they can see you. And it's this tiny little dive place. But, oh, my God, it's awesome. Oh, there, there's there's two places I want to go before I die and eat food. <laughs> and it's yeah. Chicago for a Chicago deep dish pizza and Philly for a Philly, actual real Philly cheese. Oh, the real deal? Yeah. yeah. The real well, deal. Well, if you're ever up here, man, we can. Uh, we'll we go can dinner. That's for sure. That. Um, I think, yeah, it's so funny with, and you know, I'm, um, not to go on a big pizza rant, but, uh, I, I, I go back and forth between New York style and Chicago. And I know you're not supposed to say that, but it's, uh, there's some awesome New York places. Um, I can imagine a joke. Um, but yeah, for the deep dish, if you're, if you're up here, um, people will tell you lose, they're going to tell you Giordano's and Giordano's pretty um, but yeah, the best is definitely Pequods. Hey, before I let you go, would you care to do a promo for my podcast? Yeah, man, for sure. It's Dave McAnally from Derision Cult, and you're listening to Bod's Mayhem Hour. Hey, everybody stick around. We got some great, great stuff coming up, and you only hear these interviews right here on Bod's Mayhem Hour podcast. Get out and check out our Facebook page, and please subscribe to our YouTube page because, trust me, we got a lot of good stuff coming up, and I need the subscribers, folks. Come on. Help me out. I help you help me. But uh, anyway, you want to get out and check out uh, The Risen Cult. Check out Dave's other projects, all the stuff that he's got. Please support him. Give him a chance. And I guarantee you'll like his stuff. So, Dave, thank you so much. And I, I appreciate your time and wish you nothing but the best of luck, man. Thanks a lot, man. It's good talking to you. to Bud's Mayhem Hour. Follow us on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram.